Uh, great, uh, Augustine. Thank you so much. And thank you for that just terrific um, opening. Um, you have just really a spectacular lineup um, for this conference, all the people that I would want to hear from and learn from. And so I'm not fortunately going to give all the answers um, to this question. Um, hopefully a lot of those answers will emerge over the course of the rich discussions today. Um, but what I'm going to do is maybe frame some of the issues, provide some perspective from my work on pro-competition digital regulation, which was not specifically um, in the finance space, and then talk about some of the issues in finance. Running through my remarks today, there's going to be four themes. First of all, not everything is good in traditional finance. There are a lot of problems that need to be solved by innovation. Perhaps chief among them is the millions, tens of millions around the world, billions of people that are unbanked, that don't have great access to the financial system. For people who do have access to the financial system, fees are often too high. Um, there is um, payments can be slow, payments can be especially difficult across borders, um, and they can be costly as well. So there is room for innovation in this sector. There is room uh, to solve some of those problems, whether it comes from within the sector, whether it comes from outside the sector, or whether challenges from outside the sector help drive those innovations from within the sector. So that's the first point. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that um, it's not that everything's perfect now and we're worried about disruption. There's a lot of things um, that would be good to see innovation in. Um, the second is I'm going to talk a lot about concerns about big tech and competition. In fact, I'm going to talk a lot more about that than the following point that I don't want us to lose sight of, which is that not everything about big tech is bad. Um, big tech has produced products that are attractive to a lot of people. It's ex uh, done that both with scope, um, but also by integrating a range of features that um, consumers like and like to use. And so you know, maybe they have something to contribute to the different problems that I outlined in terms of the unbanked fees, the payment system, and the like. The third point that's gonna run throughout everything I say is that there are good features and there are bad features. And right now they come um, bundled together. The good features are the ones I just described, um, but the bad features are um, uh, all of the ones that um, lead, you know, the, all the ways in which monopolization can lead um, to abuses, make it harder for other companies to enter, give consumers less choice, lead to less innovation. And so we have to look at the sector and be simultaneously have two halves of our brain working, the part that recognizes the good that might help solve some of the longstanding problems in finance and um, the bad that we've been concerned with in other areas. Finally, uh, my last big overarching point is that you know, our goal of whatever we do in policy is to get more of the good and less of the bad. Um, there's not an obvious simple answer to that. It's not as simple as there's enough good that you can just ignore policy altogether, nor is it as simple as there's just bad and so you wanna keep big tech out of finance. Um, you need to figure out more subtly and complicated. What makes this especially complicated is it's much better to get this right up front rather than um, try to solve it 10 years later. Um, what we've seen in the digital space is the longer you wait, um, the harder it can be to establish new entrants, to enable um, competition. There's a certain amount of the toothpaste that just can't be put back in the tube if, for example, you let a company merge over and over again to a monopoly position. So somewhat awkwardly, I at least don't have the answers. 
I hope a lot of answers emerge from this conference because I don't think we have 10 years to study this topic and get it right. 10 years from now, the problems would be a lot harder to solve. We need to do it now, but we also um, need to get it right, balancing the good and the bad. So those are some of the themes that you're gonna hear um, over the course of my comments. And let me proceed um, to those comments now. Um, I wanna step back and talk about the economics of increased concentrations. I think it's important to have that in all of our heads, then get to the issues around digital competition. Um, I then want to share with you what uh, I recommended, my panel recommended to the United Kingdom, and they're implementing. So I think it does provide a model for at least part of how to address the issues that we're all concerned with today. Um, and then finally, want to talk specifically um, about the topic of this conference, handling big tech in finance. So let me start out with a very old product. This product is much older than the internet. This product is much older than banks um, as we know them. Um, this product has been made for thousands of years and it's beer. These are two beers uh, that a lot of Americans drink especially see college students on campuses like mine drinking Budweiser and Heineken. These are a lot of other beers. Joe IPA, Elysian, Affigen, Mort, Sudit, Sibel. I confess I don't know most of them. I don't drink most of them. Um, it looks like there's quite a variety of beer out there. But if you look carefully, all of the beers I'm showing you are made by two companies. Um, Anheuser-Busch InBev, and Heineken. In fact, you see the large majority of beer in, consumed in America, and the same is true in many other countries around the world, is made by these two companies. Um, it's made by them in part because they've developed other brands, but in part because they've also acquired other brands. We see this not just in beer, but throughout the economy. We see it in um, consumer products, um, cell phone access, internet service providers. We see it in mundane consumer products like ketchup and mayonnaise and mustard. We see it in what producers use like um, fertilizer and farm equipment. Throughout the economy, we see more and more sectors with often just two you know, very large players that dominate the sector, either because they've grown or because they've acquired other companies. Now, you don't wanna look at something and say just because it's big, it's bad. That was a view in antitrust a century ago associated with US Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. It's a view that's being revived by a group of people uh, that sometimes call themselves or are called Neo-Brandeisians. And they have the axiomatic that if something is big, it must also be bad. That's not the wisdom of 50 years or more of thinking on this topic in economics. Um, instead, the wisdom of 50, more, 50 or more years of thinking about this topic in economics is that when you interpret greater concentration, it could mean one of two things. It could mean that there's actually more competition, or it could mean there's less competition. More competition, think there used to be one small store in every town. There wasn't actually real competition, even if there were thousands of stores throughout the economy, because in each town, there was only one store. Now two big chains open up in every town. They destroy all the small stores. We're sad to see them go. They offered some amenities and benefits. But now there's actually more genuine competition because even though there's only two stores in the whole country, um, everyone in every town now has a choice of those two stores. Increasing concentration could also mean um, less competition. 
if it ex the path to the increased concentration extinguished competitors, enabled greater pricing power or greater ability to just be lazy, rest on one's laurels, and not innovate. So you can't just look at concentration and say whether that's good or bad. You have to ask why that concentration emerged and what the consequences of that concentration is, because concentration itself is endogenous. So broadly speaking, there's some good or natural causes of increased concentration associated with more competition. It could be a superstar firm that's really good at doing something. It makes a product that consumers like and that benefits consumers. It you know, creates, um, it, it benefits from you know, global returns to scale. But there's also bad and unnatural causes that lead to um, less competition, um, like reductions in. Sorry, sorry here. Um, I have a child who yells at me through my Alexa, big tech, um, intruding on our discussion right here. Um, that um, you know, bad or unnatural causes of less competition, reductions in merger and antitrust enforcement. Um, or increased regulatory barriers to entry. Um, and there's some that cuts both ways. I'll talk about increasing returns to scale and network externalities. Now, there's a lot of evidence that there's some bad reasons for increased concentration. I'm showing you evidence here from the United States. Um, and this is the number of monopolization cases that are filed under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. So these are cases where a company has market power and it abuses that market power by keeping others out, leveraging the market power into different areas, there's been a diminishment of enforcement. Um, there's also, I'm not showing you data on it, but a diminishment in enforcement of merger rules um, and just less funding for the enforcement agencies and courts that have generally been less friendly to both monopolization and merger cases. Um, the second is in many areas, there's been a growth of intellectual property rules, patents and trademarks, um, regulations, um, and other barriers to entry, many of which protect incumbents at the expense of new entrants. Now, as I said, there's good concentration and bad concentration. Let's just talk briefly about two sectors to give what I think are a good example. Again, data from the United States. Um, the retail sector has grown much more concentrated. The healthcare sector has grown much more concentrated. But you see a real difference between the two. When you look at markups, markups have actually fallen in retail. Think companies like Walmart that have been very aggressive in innovating. Their efficiency has gone up a lot, their output per hour. And they've passed on a lot of that innovation to consumers in the form of lower markups. Then healthcare. Um, in the United States, we've had a lot of hospital mergers. Most cities now have one or two hospitals where they used to have three or four. And that has only increased efficiency a little bit, but it's increased prices quite a lot. Um, in my view, that's happened because the authorities have allowed a set of mergers that they probably shouldn't have allowed in especially the hospital sector um, and possibly health insurers in healthcare. So I want you to have this prism in your head that concentration has risen the concentration rising can be the consequence of something good, like an innovative company like Walmart. It could be a consequence of something bad, like all the hospitals in town merging and raising prices. What about Google, Facebook, and Amazon? Are they good or bad sources of um, concentration? There's a lot of concentration in that sector. Um, which are they? I think, as I said at the outset in my framing, um, there's not a simple answer to this. In part, they've grown because they do great things for consumers. 
in part they've grown because they've benefited from rules around mergers, um, lax enforcement of monopolization rules, and um, you know, in some cases, some regulatory barriers. And so they are, to me, a combination. In part, they're like Walmart, which was an innovator and grew organically. Um, and in part, they're like hospitals, where the four hospitals got together, uh, raised prices, and didn't increase efficiency in the process. That's what I think makes policymaking in this area so tricky. You want to keep the good and do something about the bad. So let me get now uh, more specifically, um, dive a little bit deeper into concerns about digital competition. I should say, you know, three years ago, I could have given the first part of this talk and given you the economics of increased concentration. But I then would end at there's both good things and bad things in the digital space. We want to preserve the good and do something about the bad. Somebody would ask me a follow-up question as to exactly what I meant by that and how to do that. And I wouldn't have an answer to um, the follow-up question which is why um, I was excited when the UK government asked me to chair um, an expert panel that put together um, four other people, including lawyer, technologist, and economists specializing in this area, um, to actually figure out not just how to frame the problem, but you know, what to do about solving the problem. Um, we came out with something, a report that I gave the title Unlocking Digital Competition. Um, most everyone since then, including Augustine earlier in the session, has referred to it as um, the Furman Report, which made a set of very specific um, recommendations about um, the digital sector. Um, these recommendations were motivated by our analysis, which I'll share with you at um, a, a 20,000 foot or or maybe 8,000 meter uh, or 5,000 meter level. So Augustine uh, referred to these quickly before in his, in his wonderful opening to uh, today's discussion. Um, there's a lot of features that make digital markets um, winners take most through a process of tipping. Um, the first is network externalities. I benefit when more people are on a social network they benefit when I join it. If you want to advertise, um, you benefit when more people are on the other side of the social network. And all of that tends to lead to a certain amount of scale. Um, the second is there's economies both of scale um, and also of scope. There's zero, near zero marginal cost, um, which makes it possible to scale up to billions of people in some cases. Um, it's happened relatively quickly. In some cases, there's a lot of barriers to it happening that we'll talk about. Um, and also scope, integrating um, a lot of different features. Just think about the way your phone used to be a telephone, and now it's also your camera, also your GPS device, also uh, many other devices. The third is that data can be um, a barrier to entry. Um, Google search results are better because so many people search on Google and it has so much data. Facebook can um, target advertising because of all the data it has, Amazon and what it knows about how you shop. And that can make it difficult. Um, when Google was formed, it was two bright grad students with a great algorithm. It's an open question today as to whether if you have an amazing algorithm that you can um, develop something without the vast amount of data that um, others have. This is especially true um, data as a barrier to entry in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now it's possible um, to have things like um, AlphaGo Zero that teach themselves from absolutely nothing. But the more common model in AI is to train yourself off of data. And so many of the big tech companies today that benefit from these 
are most poised to benefit from AI and machine learning. This is not a very um, equipment heavy business, so capital and brands matter um, for raising. And there's behavioral um, features about consumers that do, um, do not seem to switch. That you'll see Google paying enormous sums of money to be the default search engine on um, iPhones because they know even if it takes two seconds to change your default search engine, that a lot of consumers won't do it. So these features are present in other markets as well. It's just that every one of them is especially strong in this market and they all combine together. Um, this is resulting in high or rising market shares. In this case, I'm showing you UK data from our report in search, digital advertising, mobile operating systems, and social media. Um, in almost all of these, two companies have increasingly come to dominate. Um, in most of these, the two companies are drawn from five companies, of which two might be successful in email, two or three might be successful in cloud, one or two in retail, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, just because there's one or two companies doesn't mean there's necessarily um, a problem. Economists distinguish between competition in the market, where you have multiple competitors um, at the same time, and competition for the market. MySpace was overthrown by Facebook. Facebook itself may be overthrown by something else um, in the future. And so just showing there's one at a time or one or two at a time is not necessarily evidence of a problem. Um, the question is, how much do they face competitive pressures that keep them innovating and that um, effectively mean consumers have a choice because if they get worse in quality, try to abuse their position, someone else will come along. Well, I am not content with the state of competition for the market right now. You know, a lot of the competition for the market that people point to was in the early days of the internet. It was a bit of a wild west and the search engine could go from Lycos to Alta Vista to Yahoo um, to Google. But it's been very stable for 15 to 20 years. A lot of those features that lead to the stability include data um, as a barrier to entry, for example. So I wouldn't count on there being competition for the market. So the next question is why is free costly? Zero is just another number. The equilibrium price might be negative. You pay more in cash due to advertising markets. The bigger issues though are that you pay in data and privacy. You actually are paying for these services. And then perhaps the biggest issues of all are the ones that we can't directly observe, we can't definitively document, but we worry about lost quality, variety, and innovation when there are fewer choices. Uh, most importantly, you know, Google and Facebook, um, and the same could be said of Amazon, are not just um, like Walmart, a company that grew and grew as it opened new stores. Um, something we call organic growth. Google, uh, most of the main components of it were acquired. Um, in some cases, these were aqua hires, but in many cases, it was the technology um, and the platform itself. Um, Facebook combines three of the world's four largest social networks, not because it invented those social networks, but because it bought um, two of them. So what do we do about this? Um, in uh, the UK, what we recommended and what the UK is pursuing is um, the establishment of a digital markets unit. Um, the digital markets unit would have um, three functions. The first is a code of conduct. The second is data mobility and open standards. And the third is data openness. Um, the code of conduct is similar to existing antitrust rules. It's principles for businesses with strategic market status, like access to designated platforms on a fair, consistent, and transparent basis. You can't keep some people off your platform. If you're a company that's a bottleneck company that 
people need to go, other companies need to go through. You have to do prominence of rankings and reviews on a fair, consistent, and transparent basis, and not be unfairly restricted from or penalized from utilizing alternative platforms or routes um, to the market. You can go elsewhere. Um, importantly, this would only apply to large bottleneck companies. This would not apply to medium-sized companies, not apply to small companies. So there'd still be a lot of flexibility for innovation and change. It just would be if you're close enough to monopolization, uh, this would kick in. Similar to existing antitrust rules and ideas like this have been proposed um, both by the European Commission and also passed as um, legislation out of a committee in the House of Representatives in the United States. The second part is data mobility and open standards. Um, here we took a lesson from open banking in the United Kingdom where they required, I think it was the seven or so um, largest banks to open up their APIs, let other companies build on top of it. Um, this both has direct benefits for consumers. Consumers like to be able to move their data. It lets them multi-home, use more than one platform at once. Um, it lets them switch between platforms. Um, a certain amount of this, um, the companies will correctly tell you they're doing on their own because their consumers want it, but they're doing suboptimally too little of it. Um, you can't just pass a law to say, go ahead and do this. You need to very carefully go issue through issue to balance considerations of privacy, to make sure you're still leaving room to innovate and not just locking in um, a static standard. And so it really does take um, a standing body, a regulator, like a digital markets unit, to execute on something like this. Um, finally, data openness um, is addressing the data as a barrier to entry. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this, um, whether it's making lag data available, making um, real-time data available, including data in um, data trusts, anonymized formats um, through the government and the like. Again, you can't just pass a law that says you should have open data. There's a lot of data that shouldn't be open um, for privacy reasons or because you want an incentive to collect it. Um, you need to judiciously go through um, each use case. So the United Kingdom launched the Digital Markets Unit um, back in April. And it's operating within um, the um, CMA, um, the, the, the Competition uh, Markets Authority. And um, similar ideas are underway in the rest of the world. Let me now turn um, for my conclusion back to where I started with my framing about how to handle um, big tech in finance. Um, the internet, you know, I should say, was supposed to era, usher in an era of competition. You know, people thought anyone could start a company in their dorm, low fixed costs, zero marginal costs, can take advantage of the long tail. So 20 years ago, there was this hope that this would be some new, much, much more vigorous form of competition. Um, instead, we've actually gotten more concentration. I think that's what we have to fear in uh, as big tech enters finance as well. At first, we thought it would be lots of cool little fintech startups. Um, there have been some cool little fintech startups, some of which have grown to be quite large, uh, like Square and Stripe. There's other cool little fintech startups. But um, a lot of what we've seen as we've allowed tech uh, more into finance has been a rise of big tech in the financial space bringing with it uh, both the good and the bad. So there's a fine line between leveraging market power in one sector to dominate another versus providing benefits to consumers. If they're already holding your phone, why not use your phone um, for payments? If they already have a network of friends, why not build on that network of friends uh, for payments? You know, entering finance is different from selling books. Amazon competes with small bookstores, but big tech is competing with big finance. 
big finance itself often faces insufficient competition. And that has within finance led to some of the problems like unbanked, slow payment systems, high fees, and the like. So this may be helping us solve a problem in another sector. And so we want to welcome as much of it as we can. But there's also concerns about regulatory arbitrage. The cultures of these two sectors are so different and the cultures of public policy. Tech is the ultimate unregulated sector. The philosophy is move fast and break things. Um, you cannot, in the banking system, move fast and break things. Um, if you do that, you can have um, global financial crises and um, disasters. And so the last thing we wanna see is tech succeeding, not because it has better products that it solves for the unbanked and payment systems, but because it's arbitraging, it's non-regulation to succeed in a highly regulated sector. So where does this leave us? Um, I think there's three goals um, for public policy. Um, the first is to keep as much good competition that benefits consumers as possible. They're succeeding based on superior products and increased competition, that's a wonderful thing and we should welcome it. The second is that we need, um, rather than this be the wild, wild west of unregulated um, uh, lack of competition, we need comp regulation on the digital side, um, along with tougher merger enforcement, which I didn't talk as much about, but it's an important part of the equation as well, on the digital side, to have code of conduct, interoperability, and limit growth. And the digital regulation would be focused on competition across the board, including competition um, in the payment space. Then we also, from the other side, um, need to maintain regulation from the finance side um, so that big tech doesn't engage in regulatory arbitrage. Um, this is not a detailed template of exactly what to do uh, about big tech in digital space. I don't know exactly what to do, um, but I'll end where I began on um, that it's hard to get this right, but it's gonna be even harder to clean up the errors later if policymakers um, get this wrong. So I hope by the end of today, um, the answers to these difficult and important questions have emerged. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, uh, you've laid out the, the issues really well. Um, I hope uh, we can get in a couple of questions, actually. I think that was a very rich uh, presentation. Um, so for those, of, uh, for those of you who have uh, joined the call on WebEx, uh, uh, please um, uh, raise your virtual hand. Uh, perhaps we can, um, Jason, just uh, uh, collect a couple of questions. Um, uh, Benoit, Benoit Curé, uh, go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, hello, Jason, and uh, thank you very much for your uh, brilliant speech. Lots of food for thought. I have a uh, sociological question, which is how do you make financial regulators and uh, competition authorities work together? Uh, they hardly speak to, to each other. So how, how do you create a network, a, a, an architecture, where all these different regulators will, uh, will work together? So Jason, before you start answering that, let me just uh, squeeze in uh, Stein class and Stein, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jason, and thanks very much for a very nice uh, speech. Uh, I had a question on data privacy. You didn't talk as much about it, but of course, if we have the big techs uh, get access to, let's say, payments data, they suddenly know a lot more about me than uh, they used to do in the past, uh, and it's really very valuable data. So all of what you described, could it then suddenly not accelerate and make the big techs even an unfair competitor in many fields? Uh, and um, you didn't get into that yet, but uh, issues about financial stability then probably come to the fore as well. But uh, just on the privacy, maybe some views of how to organize that. So Jason, if I may also just squeeze in a question of my own. I, I, I read the, um, the Furman report. It's, I think it's a very impressive uh, report. Um, I mean, one thing that really struck me was this idea that the traditional approach of using investigations and uh, ex post remedies may not be really the right approach for a really uh, fast moving area like this. Um, 
I mean, what is your sense of how we should approach, uh, you know, um, the uh, the regulation and uh, and enforcement of the rules? I think that would be, uh, uh, I think, very much uh, you know relevant for the uh, discussion later today and and also tomorrow. So um, over to you. Great. Uh, maybe I'll take the uh, questions in reverse order, starting with um, yours, which I think was probably the easiest because I've thought about it before. Um, and then uh, the answer to Benoit's question is going to be to ask Benoit the answer to Benoit's question uh, <laughs> because he's thought about it before. Um, yeah, that's that's a lot of you know what we came to is that the ex post enforcement leaves a lot to be desired in a sector where things are moving so quickly. If you wait, you know, if it takes you eight, 10 years for your antitrust case to work through the legal system, um, the landscape has entirely changed. The possibilities for competition aren't there. Um, there's some downsides for companies too in the ex post enforcement because it creates uncertainty about what they are allowed to do and what they aren't allowed to do. And so our view, um, pro-competition uh, regulator, was about shifting to more ex-ante enforcement, um, fleshing out um, the code of conduct, providing details about what you can um, and can't do. Um, to some degree, some companies have welcomed that and said, you know, they're happy to obey the rules. They just need to know what the rules are. Um, you know, to some degree, obviously, you hear um, a lot of the predictable complaints that you'd otherwise get. But I think, um, you know, and I think the uh, arguments for ex-ante might even be stronger in the, um, the finance space than they are elsewhere. Um, to get to um, Stephen's question, yeah, I should have talked more about privacy. I think to some degree, competition and privacy are um, complementary in that if consumers value privacy, they'll, um, you know, they'll, they'll do something about it. So for example, there are two mobile operating systems, Android and iOS, and Apple advertises heavily about privacy associated with their product. And their product, I think, is better um, at privacy than Android. And so consumers that like privacy, that could be one reason they choose to make a choice to get an iPhone rather than to get um, an Android device. So I think there's some complementarity between greater competition and privacy. But I think it's also the case that um, competition policy and competition regulation only works in areas that consumers care about. And that if um, consumers don't care about something, um, it can't work. The most extreme examples are you know, content moderation, and you know, using platforms to um, organize genocides, using platforms for child pornography. Um, competition doesn't solve those problems. And so privacy, some of it's gonna need to come from a non-competition, um, just almost a human rights perspective. Um, to get to Benoit's question, which is about the culture of these two um, industries, um, you know, <laughs> I would love to hear Benoit, and hopefully you'll address it on your uh, panel later today, how you do it. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think part of the answer must be asking the question itself. Um, in the UK, for example, the Bank of England has a competition mandate as one of its mandates. The Federal Reserve does not have um, a competition mandate. Now, I've seen this in the privacy space, where, again, in the UK, um, the, the privacy regulator um, doesn't have competition as part of their mandate. And you'd sort of like that to be part of it. So they ask the question, oh, if we're making this privacy rule, are we creating a barrier to entry that actually reduces competition? And you'd want them to ask that. Um, and on the other side, you'd want the people doing competition to ask what impact it would have on others. So I think part of this may be um, uh, assigning secondary mandates. Part of it may be in personnel, um, but I don't, I don't have a confident answer for you, Benoit. I think that, uh, that that's, a, that's a super important question. Well, thank you, Jason, again, for um, uh, starting us off uh, 
on, on this very positive note. Um, let's um, let's uh, close the session uh, there. Uh, we'll take a couple of minutes break. Um, we will um, we'll resume at two uh, so that we can actually uh, uh, get the setup uh, uh, ready for the next session. But Jason, um, thank you again for, for giving us uh, much food for thought and, uh, and getting us off to a great start. Thanks. Uh, thank you for including me, and I look forward to the discussion. <laughs>